So good evening. Uh, thank you very much uh, to Sarah Capital to invite me uh, in order to talk to you about uh, Microsoft uh, research agenda around AI. So I'm going first to uh, tell you a little bit what Microsoft's uh, strategy is around AI. Uh, so Microsoft's strategy around AI is very simple. We want to amplify uh, human ingenuity, which means that we don't want to replace human being, but rather to be able to amplify what we are able to do. So in order to do so, we are getting advantage of the fact that despite a very difficult AI history, uh, we are now in a specific moment where big computes are uh, very powerful algorithms and uh, the fact that we could benefit from massive data is coming together in order to be able to innovate in AI. So AI has gone through some very interesting breakthroughs during the 10 last years, especially in different domains like vision, uh, as an example, we have been able to uh, gain a big AI competition in, 90, in uh, 2015 uh, through uh, image recognition. So in order to do this image recognition, we have built uh, 152 layers uh, deep learning model and we have been able to reach uh, the 96% accuracy using this special residual network uh, model. So we have been able to beat human as at this exercise. Same thing with speech recognition, uh, where we have been able to reach almost uh, the level uh, of error rates uh, a human is able to accomplish. Uh, same thing around language recognition, uh, where through uh, Skype Translator, we are able to uh, recognize language and to translate it in real time to foreign language in order for uh, the remote attendee to the conference to be able to listen uh, in its own language. So some very interesting uh, breakthroughs have been able to uh, be accomplished through those 10 last years, especially uh, using uh, neural network and uh, especially deep neural networks. So our goal is to bring AI to every developer, whatever the platform is, which means that through the cloud and through the edge, we want to bring intelligence to any app. In order to do so, we are building a complete cloud plus AI stack in order to provide uh, some very easy to use machine learning services, some ready to use cognitive services, some bot services in order to build bots. All those services are sitting on top of various deep learning toolkits some of those are built by Microsoft, like CNTK. Some others by uh, Google as TensorFlow or uh, the uh, open research community like Scikit-Learn. And the goal is to uh, be able to use those different toolkits uh, through a new initiative 
that we have recently launched with Facebook uh, called Onyx, uh, Open Your Net Exchange, whose goal is to be able to uh, extract a deep neural network model and to be able to run it uh, wherever uh, the platform is. At the same time, we are building a big infrastructure in order to be able to operate those models during the building phase and during the execution phase using CPU, GPU, but also FPGA, uh, ASICs, and some uh, custom silicons. So the goal is to be able to use this infrastructure to run all those models, knowing that in some cases, like everything related to uh, language translation and language recognition, we need to use uh, thousands and tens of thousands of GPUs in order to uh, build uh, those models uh, during uh, a few days and potentially a few weeks. So this stack has enabled us to build some interesting applications like uh, we have done around uh, our bot networks, bot frameworks in order to uh, build bots. As an example, this has been used by Stack Overflow in order to help developers uh, to take advantage of this bot uh, in order to help a developer facing a specific problem to uh, ask the bot how to uh, develop uh, in his or her uh, working environment, uh, producing some uh, code snippet, snippets they could integrate in their uh, uh, in the code they are currently uh, developing. So that's uh, just an example of what's possible uh, using uh, bots. Same thing, uh, we, are, uh, we have been building a lot of cognitive services which can be invoked through REST API in any code running on any kind of platform. So it could be uh, vision, speech recognition, language recognition, knowledge, uh, search, and a few labs that could be potentially used in order to get advantage of machine learning. Those uh, services are either usable as uh, finished services that you can potentially invoke in your application, or you could potentially customize those services if you need uh, to operate on a different language or a, a different um, domain ontology, as an example. So when you use uh, those services, you could bring some very fancy application uh, which you could potentially run on any smartphone, as an example. So those services are available here, and I'm going to show you a quick video uh, on how those services could be used in order to change people's life. So could you please roll the video? Thank you. I'm Isaac Lipschek. I lost my sight when I was seven. And shortly after that, I went to a school for the And that's where it was introduced to me for computers. And that really opened up a whole new world of opportunity. I joined Microsoft 10 years ago as a software engineer. I love making things which improve people's lives. And one of the things I've always dreamt of since I was in university was this idea of something that could tell you at any moment what's going on around you. I think it's a man jumping in the air doing a trick on a skateboard. I teamed up with like-minded engineers to make an app which lets you know who and what is around you. It's based on top of the Microsoft Intelligence API, which makes it so much easier to make this kind of thing. The app runs on smartphones, but also on the pivot head smart glasses. 
when you're talking to a bigger group, sometimes you can talk and talk and there's no response and you think, is everyone listening really well or are they half asleep? And you never know. I see two faces, 40 year old men with a beard looking surprised, 20 year old woman looking happy. The app can describe the general age and gender of the people around me and what their emotions are, which is incredible. One of the things that's most useful about the app is the ability to read out text. Hello, good afternoon, is your menu? Great, thank you. I can use the app on my phone to take a picture of the menu and it's going to guide me on how to take that correct photo. Move camera to the bottom right and away from the document. And then it'll recognize the text. Read me the heading. I see appetizers, salads, panines, pizzas, pastas. Years ago, this was science fiction. I never thought it would be something that you could actually do, but artificial intelligence is improving at an ever faster rate. And I'm really excited to see where we can take this. As an engineer, we're always standing on the shoulders of giants, building on top of what went before. And in this case, we've taken years of research from Microsoft Research to pull this off. I think it's a young girl throwing an orange frisbee in the park. For me, it's about taking that far off dream and building it one step at a time. I think this is just the beginning. So if you want, you can download this application. It's called C, Sing AI, and it's available in the Apple Store. So now I'm going to switch gears and to talk about Microsoft Research AI agenda. So if you look at uh, the AI community since the 1950s, it has been built on four major pillars, perception, learning, reasoning, and natural language recognition. So in order to work about all those topics, uh, we have been hiring a lot of talents from uh, multiple areas of AI. And in fact, what happened is uh, there has been a lot of various research domains in AI. And basically, uh, all those domains uh, used to work in different silos. So uh, recently, about two years ago, we have taken the decision to reorganize completely our research around AI in order to uh, break those rules uh, between the various research communities and to make sure that everybody was able to uh, cooperate around AI. So we have about uh, 7,000 people uh, working on AI research today, uh, which means that there are a lot of people and we need to make sure that uh, they are working together on all those various domains uh, where in fact uh, we could potentially use those various competencies and to make them work together uh, in order to reach a new uh, world around AI. If you look at our key aspirations around AI, there are three main aspirations. The first one is to attain more general intelligence. Second, master human and AI collaboration. And the third one is to provide insights on AI, people, and society, as AI has a lot of impacts on uh, the society as a well. whole. First topic, general intelligence. If you look at what we are currently able to accomplish using AI, uh, we are using narrow AI, which means that AI is uh, specialized in a specific topic. And in order to go further, we need to integrate those various intelligence and to combine their competencies uh, into what uh, I've called here in symphonies of intelligence. So in order to reach this goal, we need to first uh, have a deeper understanding in uh, the computational foundations of intelligence uh, and to study how those sets of competencies and capabilities uh, can be brought together into richer and more general intelligence. So the goal is to explore how to uh, bring together uh, multiple skills 
so in order to do so, we have four key challenges to address. First, we need to understand how to learn the world in an unsupervised manner, which is basically how uh, young children are learning, uh, which is far away from most of AI are able to accomplish today. We also need to endow AI system uh, with common sense reasoning, which is something uh, also which is uh, very far from what we are able to accomplish today. We also need to uh, embed some key sets of social and emotional skills that uh, human beings are able to get uh, in order to uh, collaborate and co coordinate uh, multiple AI working together. And we also need to embed uh, more knowledge about uh, the physical world, uh, like, as an example, uh, make an AI system to understand what gravity means, uh, which a young child is able to understand and which AI has some difficulties to, to handle today. Second key aspiration is uh, to promote and master uh, human and AI collaboration. This means that uh, we want to augment and extend human capabilities and we want to uh, use some uh, research, uh, recent results from cognitive psychology research in order to complement uh, human intellect abilities. As an example, as humans, we have some blind, blind spots, biases, gaps. So the goal is to design an AI which is able to complement uh, what uh, holes or bias or lacks of uh, which are sitting in the human intellect today. So it resides in uh, some gaps in memory, attention, judgment, and our goal is to be able to extend human capabilities in those various domains. So in order to do so, we need to augment uh, what people and organization are able to achieve via machine intelligence. Uh, we need to coordinate uh, the collaboration between uh, machines and people. And in order to do so, we think that we could potentially leverage results from cognitive psychology. The goal being to design systems uh, which are able to mix initiatives between uh, human and uh, machine uh, by using machine learning and inference and also uh, be able to design systems that are able to learn and optimize their interactions. So we are relying on inferential methods to understand people and their intentions their needs based on their histories, activities, and the content they generate, which means that to provide more context to AI interaction with humans. So this is a very difficult challenge, but we believe that it is a very promising one. Last one, insights on AI people and society. So there are a lot of topics that we need to cover in this area, like trustworthiness and safety when you, uh, you are using autonomous car, safety is uh, paramount. Fairness and accuracy is also a very important topic. Transparency and how to be able to explain uh, what AI has been able to accomplish is also a very difficult topic. So. Those are the various topics on which uh, we are also working around AI, people, and society. So I'm going to finish my talk by talking about a few in-progress topics. I'm not going to cover all of those, but I'm, I'm going to go a little bit deeper into some uh, selected items. First, data scarcity. We hope to be able to live in a very data-rich environment, but there are a lot of contexts where the, the, the amount of data available is not 
so important. Uh, this is especially true in everything related to um, medicine, as an example, where uh, the, the, the number of uh, data, the, the amount of data available is not so rich. So in order to cope with this data scarcity environment, we need to uh, do better in transfer learning. We need to be able to get advantage of rich simulations. Uh, we need also to use uh, generative models which are very uh, promising in order to generate uh, artificial data uh, and to be able to get advantage of those data. So this is an example of what we could uh, call uh, embedded deep transfer learning. We have reached this very large uh, 152 layers uh, image recognition model uh, based on one million photos. So if you want to embed this model in a very small device, it's unfeasible today. So our goal was to be able to uh, cut, uh, this is why I'm using a knife here, uh, the model in the top layers, moving from the inputs to the outputs. And so when you could cut this model, uh, you get an output feature vector, uh, which you could potentially cut a little bit deeper. And to use the input, you can complement this model by a very simple uh, K uh, ne nearest neighbors in order to build an image recognition model where you could potentially uh, use some inputs in order to uh, use this environment in the doorbell environment when, where you want to uh, recognize uh, uh, people which are allowed to enter in your house, as an example. So this is uh, what we have embedded in this demo machine uh, using a very small Raspberry Pi environment with a small camera. And uh, this is the output of this environment where you learn here. Uh, this is, the video is a little bit accelerated, so you, took, you take uh, four examples of this, those various people's faces, then you test the environment, and if you look at the results, uh, most of the time uh, the image recognition is uh, perfect. Here is a little bit a problem, but you can use it in an operational environment. Other topic, uh, learn generative models. So this is a very promising topic. Uh, one example I'm going to use here is to how to harness physics. Uh, as an example, if you have a very uh, big uh, machine learning pipeline, you can potentially embed uh, in this pipeline uh, a an environment which simulates uh, physics reality as far as uh, the light, the shape of an image. Uh, so the goal here is to replace uh, some steps of this pipeline by a physical engine, where you could potentially uh, recognize faces uh, which are uh, here presented uh, through a different angle and potentially different light. Uh, and so on and so forth. So this is also a very uh, promising environment. Uh, about the AI infrastructure, I want to finish uh, by giving you some insights about what we are uh, moving to. This photo represents uh, uh, some pieces of a uh, quantum computer. So we now have in our, our uh, Azure cloud environment, a lot of GPUs and FPGAs. Uh, I think we have the largest FPGA installation in the world, uh, by far. Uh, but we believe that we could do more uh, by uh, using uh, this strange device, which is uh, the basic uh, step of uh, a, uh, a quantum computer. So 
quantum computing could help a lot uh, machine learning steps, especially uh, around uh, matrix inver inversions. Uh, you could p get exponential improvement in this environment. Uh, you could then build new model for data uh, and get uh, more uh, uh, efficient training with fewer appro approximations in such an environment. So if you look at what we could potentially do in this environment, uh, you could potentially accelerate all those uh, algorithms. Uh, the only algorithm that we are not able to train uh, is deep learning, in fact, because most of the uh, uh, quantum environment is working on uh, linear alge algebra, and uh, unfortunately, deep learning is relying on nonlinear uh, uh, equations, but we have good hope that we could potentially uh, replace deep learning uh, networks by uh, quantum Boltzmann machine training, and this looks very promising. So we think that uh, using uh, quantum computing, uh, we could accelerate a lot, uh, uh, quite a few uh, machine learning algorithms. So. I'm going to stop here because <laughs> apparently it's time for me to do it. I just want to cover one thing which I think is very interesting in um, machine learning, uh, which is uh, secure multi-party computation. Uh, if you want, as an example, to have multiple uh, contributors uh, to a model, and you want that any party collaborating to uh, this model uh, will not share data with other party. So in order to do so, uh, we believe that uh, we could build a solution uh, where, as an example, uh, pharmaceutical companies will be able to share data in the same model, but not sharing data with their competitors. So in order to do so, uh, we are relying on a new extension of the Intel architecture called SGX. Uh, and the goal of this extension is to enable you to create what is called an enclave, where code and data uh, are entering in the CPU as encrypted information. Inside the CPU, you are able to decrypt it using a key that uh, the user has been able to provide, and the output from the CPU is again encrypted. Using this environment, you are able to share data when you build the model, to share potentially the output, but all the data are not shared between the various parties. So this, I believe, is very promising. It could also be, uh, be used in the blockchain environment. I'm not going to cover it here, as I don't have time. But this is a topic on which uh, we are uh, producing uh, some uh, very interesting uh, prototypes which are uh, near uh, to be able to uh, be used uh, in production. So uh, thanks for your, your attention. I'm going to answer your questions. Uh, you can join me here, Bernard. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you for your presentation. Well, what's great, Bernard, is, is there were so many topics to address that I could give you many slots, many 20-minute slots, just to address all these topics. Uh, and the last one is, is, I would just start with this one, and then I'm going to, to let the audience uh, ask questions. But the last one is very interesting because it's true that uh, access to data is usually the main challenge for uh, uh, startups. And most of the time, uh, uh, the, the data providers, they don't want to share data between each other. Uh, so quick question on that one, how far are you in, in this implementation? Uh, is it, in, when can we use this kind of technology? So uh, this implementation is, uh, has now a, uh, a commercial name. Uh, it's called Azure uh, Confidential Computer a Computing Service. Uh, so it's currently available in a private preview it is supposed to be available uh, in the spring time frame uh, in a global preview for everybody. 
and uh, we, we think that it will be available uh, before the end of this year, uh, which means that this scenario will be usable. And, and the goal is, is to, to address industry by industry? You know how you want to do that? No. Or? no, the goal is to be able to use this environment for any industry. So we are uh, technology providers. We are not providing any kind of vertical solution. So we hope that uh, startups, uh, customers, uh, ISVs will be able to build applications uh, using this technology. Uh, it's not our goal to compete with our customers. Okay, thank you. Any question? Since we're running out of time, over there. Alex in the back. There's a question over there in the back. <laughs> Run. <laughs> Um, what's your uh, what's Microsoft's stance on uh, AI safety? And when you were talking about interfaces with uh, humans, um, what kind of interfaces and how does that relate to AI safety as well? Uh, this is a topic on which uh, we are doing a lot of research uh, today. AI safety um, has a lot of implications. There are some human interface implications, there are some legal implications, there are some ethics implications, there are some uh, society as a whole implications. So uh, those are the different topics on which we are working. So this is a topic on which we are not working just as uh, statisticians or uh, data scientists. Uh, we have also uh, a lot of um, sociologists uh, uh, who are working with us in order to help us to understand the challenge. So it's a multi-domain, multi-dimensional topic on which uh, we are working uh, with a lot of different uh, point of view uh, on the same topic. So um, I I'm not going to, to give you a quick answer like we have a solution and it's here, downloadable as uh, an, an example or a sample. Uh, but uh, this is a topic on which uh, we have published a lot of different papers. Uh, this is also a topic on which uh, we are working on as a company uh, within a global initiative called uh, Partnership on AI that we have been uh, founding uh, with a lot of others. Uh, like uh, the usual, uh, usual sp suspects like Google, Facebook, uh, Apple, uh, Amazon. And uh, this uh, partnership on AI initiative has been joined uh, by a, a lot of NGOs, uh, like, um, as an example, um, uh, the, uh, <laughs> I'm, I, I've, I've lost the, the names, but, um, uh, you can find a, a partnership on ai.org uh, uh, website, website, all uh, the NGOs which are now uh, members of uh, this initiative. The goal is to be able to answer uh, some uh, social, uh, social challenges uh, which are very difficult to handle uh, from our just uh, only point of view. We need to, to work uh, together in order to solve those very difficult challenges. Okay, any other question in the audience? Okay, a quick one I have uh, was, uh, so you had the slide on, on uh, AI and cloud. Uh, but the question was more, do you, where do you think you should put the intelligence? Do you have to put it in the uh, cloud environment? Do you have to put it in the, in the end device? So is it centralized uh, in the uh, cloud environment? Is it decentralized in the, devi in the device, like for a personal assistant? What's your view on, on, on that one? Is it a challenge or not? Do you have already an opinion what should be done? Uh, and it's also related, in a way, to data, privacy, to, the, to data privacy also, because do you want the data to leave the device or stay on the device? And so do you want to apply the algorithm directly on the data on the device, or do you allow data to, to go on the cloud? So I think it depends. Uh, it depends on the kind of 
uh, AI you want to build. Uh, if you have a very large model uh, relying of, on a very large amount of data, uh, using the cloud is not an option today. Uh, but uh, there are two parts. Uh, you first have to build uh, the model, then to run the model. So the run part could be most of the time uh, being handled in the device itself. So uh, depending on uh, your needs, depending on, uh, I've covered this topic a little bit in uh, my scarcity part. Mm -hmm. So uh, the goal is not only to rely on very large, uh, uh, very large and uh, with a, a lot of hidden layers in uh, deep neural network uh, nets, uh, but also to be able to rely in a smaller uh, model that we are able to run on very small devices. Otherwise, uh, you mentioned uh, privacy. Uh, that could be a problem, knowing that um, we will uh, will have to comply with uh, the the new uh, um, regulation regime, the, the GPD, GDPR uh, in Europe, uh, starting in May. Uh, so um, this is not an option to to be compliant as far as privacy is concerned. Uh, and our th other uh, answer to this problem is also to rely on what I've described as a multi-party mm -hmm. uh, sharing environment. Uh, the goal being for us to execute a model as a black box where we don't know what is the algorithm, we don't know what are the data, so we operate this data on behalf of our customer without knowing uh, on what they are work currently working. So that's a, a possible answer to the privacy concerns. So it's cloud and edge. Okay. It's not edge uh, only, it's not cloud only, it's both. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Bernard. Really interesting. So thanks again.